Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice introduction and, and thank you for all the students for joining this uh, fantastic summer school and for the organizers for organizing it, which is kind of complex in this uh, current uh, weird situation where we cannot travel. Um, so it's a pleasure to, to give you this uh, lecture, which I hope will kind of cover uh, what we know about marine diastrophic cyanobacteria nowadays and some hints of, as well of most um, current research or more uh, contemporary research, as well as way, ways forward. Okay, so this is the outline of the lecture for today. I will first introduce what nitrogen fixation is and where nitrogen fix, uh, fixers or diastrophs and which kind of uh, different types we find in the ocean, followed by um, what is the role in, in marine biogeochemistry and why we worry so much about them. Then I inserted a whole section about climate change because we are, this is an outstanding issue nowadays. We are all worried about it. So um, there are some ideas of what um, Diasotros will behave like in the future ocean. Then a short section about um, current research on marine cyanobacteria, specifically on diasotros of what are the uh, advances, most current advances in the field. And finally, some uh, wrap up take home, take home messages. Okay, so starting by the introduction. So what is nitrogen fixation? So here's the, well, the just the chemical equation up here. So um, the nitrogen is present in the atmosphere. It makes the most of our atmosphere and it's reduced to ammonium, um, well, to ammonia here um, by specialized organisms that we call diasotropes or, or nitrogen fixers. So this is a very um, energetically expensive process. It takes about uh, 16 ATP. And not everybody can do this, so this is why uh, marine diastrophic cyanobacteria are so uh, important because uh, not everybody is able to use this kind of nitrogen that is otherwise inert for everybody else. So the way this works in the ocean is that uh, atmospheric nitrogen is dissolved into seawater and then there it's fixed by these diastrophs and uh, becoming into ammonia. Uh, finally, it can be further oxidized or reduced to other forms such as uh, nitrate or ammonium, and this is more easily used by other uh, plankton, uh, specifically phytoplankton or other, um, also bacteria and primary producers. So um, they actually fuel uh, nitrogen cycling in the ocean and uh, an important part as we will see of primary productivity. So we call them diasotrophs. It actually just comes from the Greek. Uh, D is two, aso is nitrogen, trophos is nutrition. So literally, these are uh, the bugs that eat or feed on uh, nitrogen. And they are quite diverse. So here is a tree of the NIFA gene. The NIFA gene encodes for a subunit of the nitrogenase enzyme, which is the enzyme they use to fix the nitrogen. And you see the cyanobacteria here in one branch, but there is actually a, a much wider diversity up there. As we will see, there are also uh, other bacteria and archaea that also fix nitrogen in uh, the mar in marine ecosystems, not only in the European Ocean, but also associated to corals or in sediments, for instance. So here I have uh, some pictures of the most, maybe the best known groups of uh, diasotrophs. Um, cyanobacteria uh, can be filamentous and also unicellular, as we will see later. Among the filamentos, there are the heterocystous ones. So these are the ones that have heterocysts. These are specialized cells that have a very thick wall. So this thick wall prevents oxygen from diffusing in. And this is where nitrogen fixation happens, actually, because oxygen deactivates the nitrogenous enzyme. So some of these uh, filamentous and bacteria have these heterocysts. Um, some like Nodularia spumigena or Afanisomenon, they are very abundant in the Baltic Sea and they form large blooms, as we will see later. And then there are also um, filamentous cyanobacteria that live associated to other phytoplankton, as for example, this Richelia rhizosolenia association. Rhizosolenia is a diatom, and uh, some of them have Richelia actually living inside them, providing them with uh, nitrogen. But in the open ocean, probably uh, the best known diasotroph is Trichodesmium. There are different species. This is one of them. 
and they actually don't have the terraces. So um, how they fix nitrogen without protecting their nitrogenase from oxygen is still quite of a mystery. Um, but they seem to do so through a combination of uh, spatial and temporal uh, separation. So they fix nitrogen uh, during the day, but in the specific parts of the filament, and they have high respiration rates to uh, get rid of that uh, sort of contaminating uh, oxygen. And as I said before, some of these filamentous groups, um, they are capable of forming these huge blooms. So here's a picture of uh, a bloom of Nedularia in the Baltic Sea, a very recent picture that was posted by NASA. And you see these amazing green swirls, it's very impressive. And I don't know if you see very well, but there's this, this track. This is a cargo ship just crossing the, um, the bloom. So this gives you an idea of the immense size of these blooms. Trichodesium are also very uh, well known for forming blooms uh, just like that. They are just a, a little bit more brownish. And this is a bloom in New Caledonia in the South Pacific. And they form very typically these uh, slicks in, in the surface. Okay, so now moving to the unicellular ones. Um, basically, uh, we classify them as using A, B, and C, uh, starting by, by using A. Uh, this is a pretty uh, interesting cyanobacterium. So it's very small. Uh, it's about one micron or even less. And it lives associated to um, a karyotic algae host, such as Rhinocephites in this case. So back uh, 12 years ago already, uh, UCNA uh, made it to the news quite, quite a bit uh, because it was found that they don't have um, the genes for uh, photosystem 2 meaning they cannot do photosynthesis. So, um, and later when their genome was uh, sequenced, uh, we actually also saw that there was no um, genes for fixing carbon in their genome. So this meant that they are probably in an obligate symbiosis with uh, these algae because they must uh, uh, provide them with the, the carbon they, are, they cannot fix themselves. So, uh, Later studies, more recent ones, have uh, looked at the diversity, the microdiversity of this UCNA, and actually there are different oligotypes. So here we see uh, UCNA 1 and 2, but actually there's also 3 and 4, and maybe yet, yet more to come. And they are actually quite different in, in, many, in many aspects. So UCNA is smaller than UCNA 2. Um, of using it too, uh, they are uh, associated to different hosts and also their natrium fixation rates seem to be uh, different as well. So there's uh, a lot more um, to find out still about this impressive little bug. Uh, we also have um, UCB, as I said before, um, its cultural representative is Crocosphere, what Sunny they have a size somewhere in between four and eight microns, depending on different uh, ecotypes. And uh, there's also using C, which is more similar to Cyanotiki, which is more broad shaped and in size is very much similar, sometimes slightly bigger than Crocosphera. Okay, but uh, even if the um, the course, the summer school is about cyanobacteria. I would like to call your attention to the fact that not only cyanobacteria are fixing nitrogen out there. So here you have, a, again, a more comprehensive NIF H3. And in green, you have the cyanobacteria. And the blue here uh, is protobacteria. So uh, this is a compilation of all NIF H gene databases uh, available and you clearly see that protobacteria are dominant so they are uh, much more diverse there are much many more species of non uh, cyanobacterial diasotrophs in in seawater and when we look at their distribution they also seem to be more sparsely distributed so um, this is the distribution of just gamma a which is a type of uh, nitrogen fixing gamma protobacterium and we see that uh, it abounds in like tropical and subtropical regions, but also in more moderate and um, uh, higher latitudes and even uh, close to polar, uh, to polar seas. So this is uh, quite impressive. They seem to be uh, pretty com cosmopolitan. However, researchers have had so far a hard time in isolating uh, these guys. Uh, there is a group in Denmark, the group of Lazar Riemann that has isolated um, 
several screens from the Baltic Sea. And a group from Germany, from uh, MPI, has been able to isolate uh, this alpha protobacterium, Sagittula castanea, from the eastern tropical South Pacific. Um, but so far, uh, we lack the methods to actually measure the nitrogen fixation rates specifically, and there is much more diversity out there, so it's quite difficult to, to quantify them. Okay, so coming back to our cyanobacteria here, um, and to the ocean, um, there is uh, some uh, databases that are starting to see how uh, the isotopes are distributed globally. And this basically depends on um, many um, environmental constraints or physiological properties of each different, of each of these different groups. So um, back in like two, two decades ago, we thought that uh, nitrogen fixers or diisotropes need to be uh, just away from nitrogen rich places because fixing nitrogen is so energetically expensive that why would you do it in places where there's a lot of nitrogen already available, such as coastal systems uh, or upwelling ecosystems as well. However, this, as we will see later, this is uh, far from being true. And now we know that there are nitrogen fixation, uh, nitrogen fixers pretty much all over the place. Um, we know that uh, oxygen deactivated and nitrogenase, they have different strategies to deal with this oxygen, but it was also thought that they will abound in uh, low oxygen um, places such as hypoxic as to iris or an oxygen in those zones. We also know that they need a lot more iron uh, than other phytoplankton. So, uh, because the, the iron is a part of their nitrogenase enzyme, so um, they abound in iron-rich waters, and also they are very uh, strongly limited by the availability of phosphorus. So this is a, a nice map uh, put together by Sarah and Capone very recently in a review in, in Science. So uh, they compare what we knew about the distribution of diisotropes uh, in the 1990s and what we know today. So before, when we didn't have molecular methods and we could just uh, look at these bugs using microscopy, we can only see the big ones, such as Trichodesma or Rikilia. And it was found in several oceanographic expeditions that they abound in mostly in tropical seas and even some subtropical areas. But now that all these uh, omics methods are out, uh, we have been able to detect uh, these guys and not until the non-cultivated heterotrophic bacteria in many other places. And uh, still, uh, so Rickelli and, and Trichodesmin are still prevalent in this kind of uh, ecosystems, but UCNA, for example, uh, has been found in Arctic waters, in upwelling ecosystems, in coastal ecosystems. So it, they seem to be pretty cosmopolitan as well. And heterotrophic uh, bacteria, again, we don't really know much about them, but pretty much they, they seem to be all over the place as well. So there is much work to do uh, to constrain the biogeography of uh, diasotrops in the ocean. Okay, so now that we know uh, a little bit more about nitrogen fixation and, and marine diasotrops, I will move to uh, what is their role in, in marine biogeochemistry and why we care about them uh, so much. So nitrogen fixation is actually considered the main source of reactive nitrogen into the allotrophic oceans. So here you have a global picture of the distribution of chlorophyll in the surface ocean. It's a satellite uh, imagery uh, from several algorithms from satellites of uh, NOAA. And uh, basically, you see that the subtropical gyres uh, are very poor in chlorophyll. And this is mostly because there is just no nitrogen out there, as, it, as you may find in more polar regions or in coastal seas. So in these regions, uh, diasotrophs are actually the main source of nitrogen available right there. And they are thought to be responsible for a high percentage of the primary production that happens in these waters. And when we look at the budget and we, com and we compare the different sources of nitrogen into the ocean, we actually see that uh, atmospheric uh, nitrogen deposition or, or fluvial inputs of nitrogen are actually one order of magnitude lower than biological nitrogen fixation. So in all, uh, it is estimated that at least 50% of the global new production is um, fueled by nitrogen fixation 
So this is why uh, we care about them so much. But just as a reminder, this uh, nitrogen fixation does not only happen in the ocean, it actually also happens in terrestrial ecosystems. So for example, in legume and cereal plants, they have uh, diastrophs associated to their roots that fix nitrogen and provide them with a natural source of nitrogen, like a natural fertilization process. However, um, since uh, the global population is uh, ever increasing and we really need a lot of legumes and a lot of cereals to feed them, um, most um, of these crops are now being engineered uh, or artificially fertilized with uh, nitrogen. And some researchers have also started to wonder if we can engineer the plants to, uh, so that they can fix uh, nitrogen themselves instead of depending on diazotrophs for their for a symbiotic reaction. And so far, to the best of my knowledge, this hasn't happened yet, but there is active research on it. And this is a comparison that I like very much. So actually rice is estimated to feed 50% of the global population. So um, just to remind that even if nitrogen fixation is a microbial process that happens at very small scales, it actually has global consequences, not only in the ocean, but also uh, on land. Okay, so um, coming back to our ocean, um, nitrogen fixation is uh, thought to um, control the oceanic nitrogen reservoir, which is set between the sources and the sinks of nitrogen in the, uh, in the ocean. So among the sources we have, as we just saw before, atmospheric nitrogen deposition, we have riverine inputs and we have nitrogen fixation that is much higher. And among the loss terms or sink terms, we have the nitrification and we also have uh, nitrogen burial among others. Altogether, the difference is about 54 uh, terograms of nitrogen per year. So this means that um, to the best of our knowledge, the nitrogen reservoir is out of balance. The budget is not closed. So, and this, um, this is something to worry about because the nitrogen content of the ocean actually sets its potential to uh, fix CO2. So it actually sets the, the, the ability of the ocean to act as a, mitigate, as a mitigator for uh, climate change. And this uh, imbalance between the sources and the, and the losses of nitrogen has worried the oceanographic community for, for quite a while. And to explain to this, I would like to introduce uh, the Redfield Ratio. The Redfield Ratio is just a ratio introduced by this researcher, uh, Redfield, in 1963. And it tells you uh, what is the balance between nitrogen and phosphorus in the ocean, which was uh, calculated to be 16 to 1. So then to measure departures from this ratio, uh, some uh, tracers came out like NSTAR. NSTAR basically measures um, how much nitrogen there is in excess as compared to what you would expect from the red field ratio, or yet the opposite, which is just P star, which measures what, how much phosphorus there, there is in excess. So um, here in the top left, you have um, uh, a global distribution of P star. And what we see is that there is a, an area of uh, excess phosphorus formation that coincides with the uh, oxygen minimum zone. So back in 2007, uh, and based on a modeling approach, Digital uh, found out that nitrogen fixation was uh, supposed to be very high in this area, just to match the nitrogen losses that were happening uh, really close from there. So uh, it was predicted that there will be a spatial coupling between nitrogen sources and nitrogen losses. So uh, this prompted a lot of in situ research and, and many uh, oceanographic ships went there and many expeditions in the decade after this and measure nitrogen fixation in these waters. And actually um, what they found is that nitrogen fixation there was very low and could not explain, was nothing like what you would expect from the model. And it was thought that this is because there is just not enough iron uh, in these waters because iron limits nitrogen fixers. And then uh, following that, uh, the group of Sophie Bonnet uh, found that they are really high in, this on, on, in the uh, Western Tropic of South Pacific. So actually uh, what they postulated is that there is a, a much uh, larger, especially coupling between the sources 
and sinks of nitrogen or fixed nitrogen in the ocean. So losses are happening here when there is no nitrogen and when there is no oxygen. And actually, uh, this generates an excess of phosphorus that travels all through the South Pacific down to the Western South Pacific, where it meets water that have waters that have a lot of iron and then that sustains high nitrogen fixation activity. But um, the lost nitrogen is not, only, is not only there. There are also other places uh, that are emerging as important nitrogen fixation hotspots that are so far uh, not being contemplated in global models or in global budgets. So here in this graph here, you see the distribution of nitrogen fixation rates in the global database compiled by Tang et al, a very uh, recent uh, update of the database. And you can clearly see that there is a geographical bias. So most of the measurements have been done in, an, in the North Atlantic. And if they have been done elsewhere, it's always like within this uh, 30 degree um, limit, more or less. So it just encompasses up to subtropical waters. But we clearly don't know what is going on in the Indian Ocean, for instance, or in the Southern Ocean, not even in the Arctic. So uh, there is clearly a geographical bias in our budgets. And actually, when we look for nitrogen fixation elsewhere, we pretty much find it everywhere we go. So um, recent work has seen uh, active nitrogen fixation in the Arctic Sea, also in coastal seas such as the eastern uh, North American coast, and even in the dark ocean. So uh, this is a, a transect in the Mediterranean Sea, and we can see that even down to 2,000 meters, you have active nitrogen fixation happening there. So this is quite impressive and certainly all these numbers are not taken into account into budgets and we are lacking a more, um, a better coverage, a better geographical coverage of nitrogen fixation measurements to actually um, be able to close the budget. Um, another um, potential term, uh, error term, let's say, is uh, how we measure nitrogen fixation. So um, classically, this has been done uh, through what we call the bubble method. Uh, this is uh, a quite simple approach. So basically, um, you have your water of what uh, your water bottle with your sample inside, and you inject 15 and gas into it, and you uh, incubate for a certain amount of time, uh, usually one day, and then you use mass spectrometry to measure uh, the 15 and enrichment. So whenever your biomass, the biomass of your cells is uh, above the natural 15 and enrichment, then you can say they fix nitrogen and using uh, mass balance equations, you can calculate your rates. So this is in theory um, fine, but um, already 10 years ago, a group from Geomar in Kiel they found out that actually because you're injecting this 15N as a bubble, as gas, the gas is not dissolving and not equilibrating with the water right away. It actually happens. This equilibration kind of increases uh, along these uh, 24 hours of incubation. And this violates the assumptions of mass balance equations because the 15N in your bottle is not constant over time. It's evolving over time. So this does not allow you to calculate your rates properly. So to overcome this problem, uh, what uh, Moradal proposed was to uh, use a different method. So they proposed to take this bubble, put it into a seawater sample, and just pre-dissolve it in, in the way that you will use a dissolved uh, 15N as a tracer instead of a gas. So then they compared it and they compared measurements of using the dissolution method and the bubble method. And they actually found out that uh, dissolution method rates are at least uh, twice as high as bubble uh, method uh, results. So this is a significant under underestimation of the rates and uh, probably many of the rates published so far are actually underestimated, but um, the dissolution of the bubble actually depends on a, a high number of factors, of physical factors affecting your sample, such as the size of, of the bubble, the temperature of your water, the salinity, the organisms inside it, inside it and so on. So it's uh, very difficult to just apply a correction factor to these rates. And what we need to do now is just to apply more uh, precise methods uh, in the future to have better rates. 
Okay, so uh, what about climate change? You may be wondering already, maybe. So um, what does the future hold for diisotropes? So um, we think our most evidence uh, points towards that diisotropes will actually be the winners of uh, climate change. So here's a figure that you may be familiar with. Uh, these are different climate change projections uh, of uh, surface temperature distributions in the ocean until uh, the end of the century. And pretty much it depends on the simulation, but uh, all of them predict uh, very uh, war in warming of the oceans as we are already experiencing. So what will happen in the oceans uh, is what follows. So uh, temperature increases, then a stratification. So how uh, or vertically organized is the water column will increase as well, impeding uh, mixing with uh, deeper waters uh, which have more nutrients. And this all together will bring oxygen levels down, increasing the extent of these oxygen minimum zones that already exist in certain areas of the ocean. So this uh, already can affect diasotropes because uh, at least the tropical ones like higher temperatures and they uh, need, low, need low oxygen uh, present for the nitrogenase to, to function. But not, all, not only that, temperature will also uh, uh, promote the certification and hence uh, does the position into the oceans. And we care about this does the position like from deserts because it's actually iron rich. So this may benefit uh, the isotropes as well. And here in this video, you see a colony of trichodesmium that is actually moving around to shuttle of uh, dust particles to the core of the colony. This is a quite impressive video that is already 12 years old. So further uh, studies have looked at this process and how uh, trichodesmium is able to process dust particles. And they have seen that actually the epibionts that uh, colonize the surface of trichodesmium filaments, they shed these um, molecules called siderophores that are able to ligate metals because otherwise uh, some of these metals such as iron may not be bioavailable for uh, phytoplankton, but through these molecules they become available to them and then they can, they can use them. And, but it's not only that, uh, you will probably also know that increasing CO2 is predicted to decrease the pH of seawater, what we call uh, ocean acidification. And most of the research in this sense has been also done in, in trichodesmium, mostly in trichodesmium cultures and not so much in field experiments. And what these uh, culture experiments have seen is an increase in nitrogen fixation rates when trichodesmium is exposed to lower pH levels. So uh, we kind of expect them to uh, fix more nitrogen in the future, in the future ocean. And, um, but also, as I said before, it's not only the pH, but it's also the decrease in uh, oxygen, which will likely not only affect nitrogen fixation, but also other metabolic uh, routes, uh, sorry, other nitrogen cycling routes driven by microbial metabolism, such as eutrophication or anamox. So altogether, um, when comparing nitrogen cycling in the, in the current ocean and in the future ocean, it is predicted that nitrogen will turn towards more uh, reduced, form as, reduced forms as compared to the oxidized forms that um, dominate nowadays. And finally, um, I'd like to pop up the question, what about the rest? Because uh, as I said before, like most of this research is being done on trichodesmium, but um, we already, we have seen that there are more uh, nitrogen fixers out, out there. So uh, here, for example, there's um, a temperature study on different strains of trichodesmium and corposphera. And basically uh, what, uh, this study saw is that trichodesmium may uh, grow uh, in a larger temperature range, whereas Procosphera can only stand a narrower window of temperature. So this is temperature alone, but uh, this probably uh, reveals different physiological properties of the different diasotrophs, which may uh, make them more or less resistant to climate change conditions. So a, much, uh, a lot of research is awaiting uh, in this sense. Okay, so now off to the current research. 
I just pulled up some um, interesting things of uh, the research that is being done on nitrogen fixation uh, currently in, in some labs, including, including my own. But of course, there is uh, much more, and I'm happy to share uh, some publications with, uh, with the students uh, at, the, at the end of the lecture or by email anytime. So the first thing uh, that we are working on in our lab now is uh, the aggregation into colonies in, in trichodesmium. So the group of Philana Berman Frank in Israel, they showed a couple of years ago in this very impressive paper, um, how um, trichodesmium uh, actually uh, aggregates when they are deprived in iron and phosphorus. So it seems that uh, whenever they, um, they don't have the nutrients they need, they tend to uh, form larger colonies. So in the video, you see how they are uh, smaller filaments and they start forming these huge uh, colonies that we call tufts. So the question is, how does uh, this happen at the mechanical level uh, from here, from forming just such a colony like that to forming these huge uh, surfaces of blooms in the ocean? So a way to approach this is to, by using some nanotechnology tools. Uh, we are uh, starting to use atomic force microscopy or AFM to study uh, the interaction uh, of filaments to form colonies. So briefly, the way AFM works is uh, you have a, a tip that is uh, pretty much like the tip of a record player that is attached to a cantilever that is flexible and this tip just scans all over your samples, all, all over your cell surface. And it does so while applying a force into your cell. So you can measure uh, the force that is pulled back out of the cell. So this allows you to make mechanical measurements uh, of the cell material. So we tried this on trichodesmium cultures and uh, here are some results. So this is a, a trichodesmium a filament and here we see the topography. So down to uh, 12 micrometers, we can see what is the, the height of the different uh, areas of the, of the filament. And when we, when we go closer, we go to the nanometer scale, we can actually see the organic matter network that is coating these filaments. So we wanted to study this further because it looks like this organic matter stuff is probably what is uh, allowing uh, filaments to stick to each other. So um, to do so, we produce some uh, force scores, and this is this uh, this is the work of my PhD student uh, Javi, um, where we can see how the tip um, measures forces while well, well it approaches the sample, your cell, and when it retracts, when when it detaches from the from the surface of your cell. So the light blue is the approach when the the, the tip is coming into the cell, and then the dark blue is when it's being pulled up. So uh, on the way back, we actually saw these uh, spikes, which suggests there are some addition events, because what this spike suggests is that the, uh, ex this extracellular matrix of organic matter was actually being uh, glued or sticked to the, to the tip of the AFM and was being pulled back with it when uh, the tip was moving up. So uh, this suggests that this material that is coating the cells is actually adhesive. So uh, now we are uh, trying to, to measure this addition uh, characteristics of different uh, trichodesmium colonies treated with different uh, nutrient scenarios or nutrient limitations. Something else we are working in our lab is um, how physics, uh, ocean physics, affect the isotropes. So when you look at the ocean, you see this magnificent uh, blue water, and it may seem that it's pretty static, but actually it's moving and it never stops. Here is a nice simulation from NASA that you can easily find in, in YouTube. If you just search for the perpetual ocean, and it shows how uh, water masses are circulating in the surface oceans, uh, forming this uh, very interesting structure, such as uh, these cir circum uh, vortexin structures that we call eddies. There are also fronts that act pretty much like a wall separating two different water masses. And there are also smaller things like filaments that shed off these eddies and, and so on. There is a large range of um, different physical structures. 
So uh, this kind of uh, physical processes have been seen to distribute chlorophyll using uh, just satellite imagery, but uh, we don't really know how they affect uh, organisms in situ. This requires measurements in situ and that need to be um, need to happen in a very high resolution because some of these uh, structures are actually um, quite quite small and, and most of all they are quite fast. They may last uh, days or uh, a few weeks. So uh, it's not like you can make one measurement one day, one specific year and come back two years after because it will be gone. And you can, all, you can all not have uh, an oceanographic boat there permanently out there for you either. So uh, something these structures is quite challenging. So here I'm showing some very recent data from a cruise uh, last year in November in, in Tonga. And we basically uh, sampled uh, for DNA in high resolution and we uh, analyzed it to quantify different groups of diastrophs. Uh, so what you see in these graphs is in, in blue color is the surface uh, height of the ocean. So it gives you an idea of the topography of the ocean and the arrows give you the, the sense of rotation of these water masses. So uh, we saw that these structures seem to um, accumulate uh, different diastrophs in a different way. So for example, trichodesmin uh, seem to accumulate in these frontal zones that are kind of at the edge of two structures. Same do uh, UCNC, but for example, UCNA or gamma protobacteria, they are not that much affected by, this, by these structures. So um, this is a mere observation, observation, actually, because we are just seeing how uh, the abundance of different groups spreads over um, structures, but we actually don't know what, what's going on there. We need physiological studies, we need trophic interaction studies to actually understand what is different in this water mass here from this water mass here and how it's affecting uh, the distribution of these diastrophs. And all the research that is being done in, in other labs that is uh, actually uh, very important uh, is, for example, um, the diversity of these diastrophs. So uh, to study the diversity of diastrophs, we uh, have been classically targeting the NIFA gene, as I showed before. And there are some uh, primers that are very degenerate that have been used for decades now. And apparently, um, they do not cover uh, all the diversity out there. So a recent paper looked at metagenome assembled genomes of uh, NIFH, and they found that actually uh, heterotrophic bacterial diastrophs, so this non bacteria that we also uh, like, <laughs> they actually uh, are much better covered when using uh, a MAC approach than when using PCR-based approaches. So there's some diversity out there that we are not catching by uh, classical methods. Um, something else that we are also quite worried about is who is diastrophs, who is actually grazing on them. Uh, a recent model by uh, Nikki Google's group um, tried to use a preliminary uh, grazing rate. And they found that when you have grazing, uh, nitrogen fixation rates are lower and also uh, differently um, distributed geographically than when grazing, than when you have a grazing term in your uh, model. So this is um, something to worry about as well, because actually um, we don't have much data. Not many uh, researchers have gone on there to measure uh, grazing rates on diastrophs, and actually uh, it is quite uh, difficult to do it and uh, affect uh, or bias your results um, importantly. Uh, but recently, a new paper out used um, a sort of submersible uh, flow cytometer that also takes pictures. Uh, and they saw, and this was north of Hawaii, they saw that some dinoflagellates, such as protoperidemium and dinophysis, strombidium, they actually graze on diastrophs and they found uh, this crocospira inside them. So this is uh, an incubation-free approach uh, that is very, uh, very promising. But uh, still, um, not only Procosphera is uh, there, and we need to, to find out what's going on uh, with the other diastrophs and who are actually grazing on them. Okay, so and now we will move to the take home messages. 
So basically, in summary, we have seen that um, nitrogen fixation may be a microbial processes, but it has global consequences in the ocean and also in terrestrial ecosystems. We have also seen that isotropes are uh, pretty much everywhere. Before, we thought that, we, that they uh, were only uh, found in tropical and subtropical seas, but actually you can find them in very high latitudes in the deep, dark ocean, in coastal ecosystems, pretty much also in other thermal bands, pretty much everywhere you go, there are diasotros out there. Also, uh, we have seen that they may be the climate change winners, but that there is much more experimentation to be done before we can confirm that. Um, and we have seen that we know very little about the physical interactions, like how uh, they stick together, also how physical uh, structures in the ocean affect their distribution. And also uh, that we know very little about their trophic interactions. Well, right now we know a lot more about uh, bottom-up interactions, how nutrients affect them, but not so much how top-down uh, interactions, how grazers affect the populations of diasotrophs. So thank you all for, for listening. Uh, I'd like to thank my, my collaborators and very especially uh, my students and with that said, um, here you have my email in case you want to contact me anytime and I'll take any questions. Thank you.